Howdy folks, I'm the game of and uh, we're about to embark on part 5 of Drew Wigger's Law Tour. Uh, I've just got a couple of jumps to make to get our starting system. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you when we get there. Right, so, uh, Drew is coming on now, so we're just flying to the generation ship and hopefully we're starting there. And good evening ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Elite Dangerous Law Tour with me, your host Drew Wager. <laughs> just riffing off the chat there, so that was good fun. <laughs> Ah, uh, dear, dear, dear. What can I say? What can I say? Anyway, lovely to have you all aboard. Lovely to have you all aboard. Thank you for uh, for joining me this evening. We're back to the law this evening. So um, every so often the tour is going to be interspersed with an interview, but not tonight, right? So we are back to learning about the background to Elite Dangerous. Um, and I will uh, do my best to guide you through, um, you know, the, the topics, right? So hopefully you've all had a chance to look at the... Our itinerary that I've published up. So we're going different places. So this week is all about generation ships and hyperspace. So it's a bit of a techie, um, a techie, a techie episode about the technology of the future, right? So that's all going to be good fun. Now um, I hope <laughs> more law. That's exactly what we want. More law, <laughs> more typos, more spelling mistakes, more memes. <laughs> All good fun. Anyway, I hope you are all well, right? Okay, we just got back from clapping the NHS, so that uh, that is all good. Um, and uh, apparently, according to our Prime Minister, we're past the peak. So um, hopefully that's good news, but uh, I remain sceptical at this point in time. So we'll have to wait and see, right? But uh, let's see how that goes. Let's see how that goes. But... Um, anyway, there we go. There we go. Right, so with no further ado, uh, those of you joining me in-game, you need to be heading to the Nefer... Uh, the Nefer... <laughs> <laughs> the Nefer something system. Where the hell are we going? Um, I can't remember. I've got it plotted. Uh, let me go and do this. Right, full screen, full screen, full screen. Because this is all professional, right? I know exactly what I'm doing. The Nefer Tim system. Okay, we're not going to the Netherlands. No, we've been there. <laughs> all right, head for the Nefer Tim system. I can see thousands of people are already there. So I better get my. Uh, um, I better get my um, Aspen gear, right? I'm back in my Cobra, obviously. So. Um, uh, off we go. Now, I've already had a wing invitation from uh, Athlan Sorn, so that's been accepted. So basically, that's first come, first served, right? <laughs> um, so uh, I'm on my way there, so we'll, we'll meet you there. It's not too many jumps for me, but there we go. Nefertim system is the place that we want to, to rendezvous, and we will uh, we will go from there. Um, so if you want to wing up with uh, Athlan Sorn and see if you can join me in my group, uh, obviously in the Drew Wager private group, um, and we can... Um, uh, we can head in that sort of direction, right? I suppose I ought to get my frame shift drive pointing in the right direction. Otherwise, I'm not going to get anywhere. So, um, just to recap on those for the law. So, for those of you who've missed previous episodes, um, it's all being um, uh, re, re, republished, if you like, on YouTube. So, if you have missed previous law episodes, you can go find it on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Drew Wager. Fairly obvious. You'll find it. It's got its own, its own category there on um uh, in Elite uh, Dangerous Law, so that's nice and easy for you to find, and uh, you can catch up on previous episodes there. Obviously, you can't join in the chat because it's been recorded, right? So if you want to join the chat, you're in the right place now. <laughs> so if you're watching this offline, <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> so um, apologies for that, but there we go, never mind. What can I do, right? Okay, so I've done my best. There's, a, there's always a problem with these things, right? I've done my best to publicize it. So I stick it on Twitter, and I stick it on Reddit, and I stick it on Facebook, and I stick it on the forums, and I stick it... Yeah, I can stick it anywhere I like, really, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and some people complain, oh, stop, stop, stop overhyping it. And then other people complain, why didn't I get told? So it's, it's an impossible balance to find, but there we go. Never mind, never mind. So uh, it's wonderful to have your company this evening. And I look forward to I hope you're popping into an instance and seeing lots of you in the, um, lots of uh, lots of you in the instance ahead. So uh, fingers crossed that Elite Dangerous plays plays nicely for us in the Nefertim position. That's not the only place um, we'll be going, but uh, we'll we'll start there. And the reason is fairly obvious. I'm sure some of you know that in the Nefertim system is a generation ship. One of the first that we're going to go and visit today. Um, so let me just get there. I don't know how many uh, jumps. There are. Uh, I've got. Oh, well, yeah. Next jump. So I'm almost there. So fingers crossed. And I can see Commander Athelion Zorn 
directly ahead, so uh, that's good. Actually, I better do a little bit of refueling while I'm here. Uh, let's just get that sorted. So, generation ships and hyperspace in the lore, okay? So, last time we did lore update, we were talking about the Empire and how the Empire had formed out of uh, kind of disagreements with the Federation, right? So, uh, the Federation is um, very much a... Uh, um, you know, kind of, kind of like the U.S., right? It was formed out of the uh, remnants of the United States at the end of the Third World War, um, and it kind of took over the Soul System, right? So, go, 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 America! <laughs> you guys won, okay? <laughs> Ultimately, in the elite law, um, and everything, all the other governments basically said, right, we'll just join the uh, join the United States, but we'll rename it because we kind of want to get away from the history of that. Then we, and that's that's the origin of the Federation, right? Uh, but a few people weren't happy with that, and they tried to get away from it, and they founded the Empire. And they travelled across space and founded the Empire uh, in the sort of 24th century by this point in time. Now, there's the period of history that we're interested in tonight is basically between 2200, mostly, and 2800. So it's quite a big chunk of the elite law, right? About 600 years. Uh, right, so I can see ships here. I uh, see a couple of ships. I can see... Uh, my wingman as well. Right, I think, let me just double check where we're going. <laughs> I should know this off the top of my head. But there's a lot to remember, right? There's a lot to remember. We are going to planet 6A. You should be looking for the generation ship Thetis. The generation ship Thetis around planet 6A. Now, I'm not sure if it shows up as a POI. In fact, I forgot to do an FSS scan of this system because I've got nothing at all. Right? I've got to remember how to do this. Uh, <laughs> no, it's all down. There we go, right. Um, right, so we just do it if this is skin. do it. Can't. Nope, wrong button. That one. Right. What's the FSF? See, I haven't played <laughs> done this for so long. I forgot my key binding. Could be one of these. There we go. That's it, right, right. Don't make it up to the scan, that shouldn't tell me where we're going. Right, let's get back out of this moment. Uh, right, so I'm on planet 6A. There we go, there we go. Generation 6 Thetis, right. So that's where we're going, right? Because this is this is an example of a generation ship. Okay, so now we know the first generation ship. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my muscle memory is focused on the Spectrum Elite. That's Saturdays, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, so right, there's Super Cruise Assist. I can keep my hands off throttle and stick. Uh, so that's where we're going. So the first generation ship was called the Mayflower, right? Left in 2097. Now, according to the original Elite law, there were 70,000 generation ships launched. Now, given that these things are pretty damn massive, right? Um, 70,000 is, is a frankly unbelievable number. Um, <laughs> it's just way too big. Um, so I think it's kind of one of those things that was in the original manual, um, and they kind of kind of went, kind of, they kind of glossed over it at the time. But it was picked up in Elite Dangerous, right? Never mentioned in any of the other leagues. But it was picked up in Elite Dangerous, and the number's been reprinted in Galnet, right? So um, the explanation that is in Galnet um, for generation ships is that most of them did reach their uh, destination right so yeah one a day for every 10 years <laughs> that's a lot of ships right especially when they're like two kilometers long or whatever it is um and um yeah that's a, that's a lot of ships to build okay and most of the generation ships were kind of pre-hyperspace or very very early hyperspace tech most of them are not hyperspace because if you have hyperspace you don't need a generation ship right the whole idea behind a generation ship is you pile it full of people um and you you have it, it goes through space at a very very relatively slow rate, uh, below light speed, in order to get to its destination, right? Um, so um, and in in doing so, the original people who set out have children. Those children grow up to man the ship. They have children that grow up to man the ship until eventually it gets to its destination. Hence the name a generation ship. Okay, there are multiple generations of colonists aboard. The idea being that once you get to your destination, presumably you go into orbit around it. You decamp from the generation ship and you settle the planet. And the explanation for the fact that there are so many generation ships in the law is that the vast majority of them did in fact get to their destinations and settle ships, right? 
Um, and yes, that could be uh, Blue Ganymede. Quite right. That could be the explanation for the missing Phobos and Deimos. Right? Is that maybe they got turned into generation ship behavior? But that doesn't explain why they didn't exist in 3250. Um, I did ask. Uh, some of you may have noticed. I did ask uh, Frontier whether <laughs> about the Phobos and Deimos question. They've 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 not answered. <laughs> So read into that what you will, right? Maybe it's some super mystery. Um, but uh, no, I've asked them a few questions uh, in regards to the law, and they've been utterly silent. Um, in fact, I don't think they've even been streaming, unless I've been missing something. I used to pop into their Monday and Thursday streams, but I don't think they've streamed since the uh, fleet carriers have come out, have they? Um, so um, yeah, kind of, it's all gone a bit, all gone a bit quiet. <laughs> but anyway, um, that regardless, so we haven't had an answer about the Phobos Demos mystery. And um, as for the generation ships, right, most of them, oh, they have just streamed. Okay, so cool. I, I must have missed that. I was, I was, oddly enough, I was watching Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, so, uh, so there we go. Okay, they are streaming again. That's cool. Um, oh, we've got disengaged. There we go. I thought I did that automatically. Oh, it did. It's, it's, oh, I got blue tunneling. So it's trying to presumably drop me into the instance. <laughs> there we go. Um, they're, they're too afraid of questions about. Yeah, I haven't really. I must admit, fleet carriers are going to be completely out of my. Um, ah, I think I may have an instancing problem here. Oh no, there we go. Right, how many of you are here? I can see a few of them. Right, so this is this is the generation ship Thetas. Now, if you are so inclined, I can see some ships ahead. Who have I got here? I've got Commander Lance, Commander Ridley, a few other ships about. Uh, just a Cobra Mark. Commander Ariok. There's a few few folks here. So anyway, so make yourself known. So this is the generation ship Thetis, right? Um, so I'm just going to park a little bit out, and if you want to come and do your thing uh, for the moment, um, I shall zoom out. There we go. Uh, no. Too many damn buttons. There we go. That'll do. Right. How do I zoom out? I did this before. Is it? There we go. The you are. There we go. It looks better for stream. I got told off for not doing this in the stream, right? It's to zoom out so that I can see, A, see most of you. Um, although I discovered there was an interesting sort of slight, not, not bug, I don't think, but um, it seemed to be a, a, a thing whereby um, you could not either knock my ship or knock my camera PI and <laughs> move everything off target. So people had great fun with that last week. But there we go. There was, there's, there's a few ships appearing here in the thesis. So again, um, Nefertim system, uh, Planet 6A, and the Generation ship theaters, that's where we are heading out. So these generation ships were sent out from the end of the 21st century for a number of years, right? Um, in my head, and this is a little bit weird in the law, in my head, a generation ship has to predate hyperdrive, right? Has to predate hyperdrive, because why would you bother building a generation ship that is a sublight vessel, okay? These are sublight vessels. Um, um, if you had a hyperdrive system, right? Um, because you know, new tech is 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 always coming on stream, and this is one of the big problems with, and this has been explored in quite a few other science fiction environments, right? Is um, you know, you send out your initial round of spaceships into the galaxy, and then, but they're overtaken really quickly by better tech from the home world, right? So, well, these generation ships um, is um, yeah, these generation ships are effectively obsolete almost straight away because the first one launches in 2097 and we've pegged the date for the invention of the hyperdrive which is also in the law right um, as about only a hundred years later is the first time they managed to come up with a working hyperdrive so trying to get all these generation ships launched and on their way is you know is, is compressed into a very small piece of the, the history of, of, of the time but it takes us a long long time to develop hyperspace technology right it takes a long long time for us to to get it working and that's something we're going to kind of explore <laughs> flying coach class <laughs> um so um so yeah so it's it's, it's a bit of a weird thing but seventy thousand of these ships were supposed to launch they were aimed at and you remember the, the Federation had done the, effectively a kind of exoplanet survey with um, hyperspace capable space probes in the law. So they had hyperspace, um, but maybe it wasn't safe to use for humans or maybe they couldn't expand it beyond a certain mass or, or something like that. It's, it's not entirely clear. The law is a bit vague about this, right? And um, as a result, they had established there were habitable or terraformable planets out in the... Um, you know, 
out in the, the relatively near confines of the galaxy. Now these generation ships could only travel at sublight speeds, right? They could travel maybe half the speed of light, maybe a bit more than that, depending on, on the technology that they used. Um, and um, as a result, they haven't gone that far away from, from the Earth, okay, from the solar system. If I look on the galactic map, let me just go back inside my ship for a moment. Um, oh, I'm getting lots. The chat goes a bit bananas. Um, let me just see if uh, anybody's just left me a friend request. I think it's it's gone a bit gone a bit crazy. Never mind. Anyway, someone's someone's chaffing me. Um, look at the galaxy map, right? So if I just lock on to Sol for a moment, um, Sol isn't very far away, right? Um, Fifty-three light years. So this ship didn't go very far at all, right? Um, so it got 53 light years in many generations, so it's sub-light, right? Okay, this is pre-hyperdrive tech we're talking about here. So the ship is, as you would expect, right? Um, uh, let's go into the free camera suite again. Let me just zoom out. Um, is is very low tech, okay? So you've got like a spinning carousel to do artificial gravity. Um, and, you know, what, what, other, what other stuff can we see from the ship? It's got storage containers, it's got kind of habitation rings, which are very old school. There's some sort of, you know, a reaction based drive system, right, at the, um, at the back there. And you can see some sort of hydroponic style domes over there, maybe to, you know, to grow food and so on and so forth. It doesn't look like a lot of a great deal of space. Um, for, for growing food. Now, the design of the ship's quite interesting, right? What's this big thing at the front? All right, okay, what's the big thing at the front? So um, I'm just gonna drive around the ship for a bit, so feel free to follow me. Um, I'm gonna see if I can drive it in, yeah, oh, actually, no, that's not gonna work. I will crash, and I don't wanna crash. Um, so I'm just gonna carefully, I'm just conscious of lots of other ships around me, I'm just gonna take a bit of a tour around the actual ship itself, so do, feel free to follow me around. Let's turn on the external lights here. Um, so we've got, let's, let's start at the beginning here. So I'm just going to sort of bank around this. We've got this sort of structure at the front, right? Which, on a traditional ship, maybe that's where you'd put the bridge, right? But um, I could switch on my night vision. That's a good suggestion. There we go. So you can, there you are. I mean, that just gives us an idea of the structure, right? So let's just zoom in down there. I only use night vision all the time, it's not takes away some of the charm, but at least you can see the structure of the ship, right? It's quite um, it's quite big. Now, so you've got the front of the ship has got this massive um, kind of vast array. I don't know, I mean I'm difficult it's difficult to gauge how far away I am from it, to be honest. I, we should that's one thing I'd like in Elite actually is a range indicator, right? Um, but have I got my lights on? Yeah, I have. Uh, so, you know, you can see it's it's a massive, massive thing. I don't know if there are there some windows on that central stub. Yeah, so there's there's some there's some stuff in there, right? Now we probably if there are is if, if there's anybody on board this one, I can't remember the story of this particular ship. Most of the ones that we find, the stories are pretty pretty sad, right? And I'm not intending to go through and listen to all the stories, but we might we might pick and choose a few. Um, but um, they're worth listening to, right? Because a lot of them are voice acted, and um, you know they're all dare I say it, they're all quite Michael Brooksy, right? <laughs> and I mean that in a nice way because um, Michael Brooks is a big fan of kind of horror and dark stories, and um, um, and um, you know kind of apocalyptic type stories. So, and I know that he's behind a lot of the generation ship kind of. Eternal stories. So, um, you know, they've got the ones that they've got. They've got quite dark tones, right? <laughs> so it's worth. Uh, I think it's probably this one is actually one of the better ones. So we, we probably will have a listen to this. Um, see if we can just go and scan it. Um, now, what we're doing here, actually, according to the original elite law, is is actually quite illegal, right? In, I mean, it, it was a kind of throwaway comment because in the. Uh, Michael Brooks, bring her death here. In the original game, in the original league, of course, generation ships were mentioned in the manual, but they didn't really exist in the game, right? Um, so they um, they were, um, as described, as we see them, you know, sublight vessels churning their way through space at semi-relativistic speeds, i.e. good fractions of the speed of light, but not hyper-fast than the speed of light. And 
the basically Galcop, which was the organization at the time of the original Malika, which again is another subject we'll get to, basically said the penalty for interfering with these vessels is marooning. If you interfere with a generation ship, you will be uh, effectively extradited, you will be cut off from all the rest of human contact. It's like it's like a proper, proper capital punishment type, I mean, not, not capital punishment in the sense of you know, death, but it's kind of like, you know, you are cut off from the rest of civilization for interfering with the ship. So it was a big deal. You're not supposed to go near them. Um, so, <laughs> so, so us sitting around, <laughs> flickering our lights and spinning around the ship, probably not great, right? You know, okay, so we, in the original world elite law, we would, we would be running a bit of risk by doing it. But it's, 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 um, you know, it is what it is. Now, the design of the ship, now this ship is probably, I'm not quite sure what date this particular one is from, we'll find out uh, maybe when we have a look at the logs, but um, um, it kind of implies that it's for generation ships that are still in flight, right? So if we do discover one in the system, um, uh, someone's trying to do some damage to it. Um, but, um, you know, they are, they are relics of a, a, a time long gone, right? Uh, and Galcop, of course, now doesn't exist, so you know, maybe, that, maybe that's been rescinded. Uh, for the anarchic nature of the elite, da elite dangerous galaxy as it is today. Um, and, um, but you know, look, let's look at this design of again, this, this ship. It's got this massive panel on the front. Now, knowing my sort of science fiction lore as I do, this, this can be a number of things, right? It is possibly a, a, a solar panel, but I think it's more likely that, that is actually a shield for the rest of the ship, okay? Um, because when you're traveling at, you know, a good fraction of the speed of light, but in normal space, any kind of debris in front of you, even when it, even when it's atomic, right, is is likely to be quite dangerous. So a, a, a shield to protect the rest of the ship from any kind of damage is, um, is, is 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 a good thing to have. And this is, I think, potentially a physical shield, right, um, just to kind of cut us away through space. So it might be a completely. Um, just a solid structure, right? Aimed at aimed at uh, deflecting space dust, and maybe this thing in the front here that somebody is firing at <laughs> it, it emits some sort of electromagnetic field. You know, classic shield technology as we have in the game today, which you know stops lasers, stops missiles, and all sorts of things. Obviously, didn't exist when these ships were made, right? So they're just physical lumps of, of spaceships, um, and um, maybe they need a maybe, maybe they need a shield in order to do that sort of thing. So that's what I think the front structure is. Um, and I know Michael Brooks, who probably had a big hand in designing the look and feel of these things. Um, you know, he's he's a big fan of science fiction as well. So we, we see that you know that I think that's a sort of shield there uh, in the front of the ship. Design it's designed to be, as you can see, relatively lightweight. It doesn't need to be too thick, but basically it's it's something that's there to be destroyed if if they do run into dust. Inside that we've got what look like kind of hydroponic bays. Uh, some kind and look how thin the structure of the ship is okay so it's you know it's designed to just thrust in one direction at a very very slow rate okay so these ships when they were launched would have exhilarated up to a fraction of the speed of light but over a really really long time so the acceleration would have been in you know centimeters per second per second right it would have been really really slow um, and we can we can sort of see um, now I don't know if I'm going to be I might be able to do this let's see if I can get just alongside this anaconda here um, you can see that um, there. If I can just train my my lights. Look, there's loads and loads of. I don't know what that is. Is that cabbage or? <laughs> there's loads of stuff to eat, right? But it's all vegetables. Um, but there's no sign of any activity in there, right? So there's some sort of hydroponics um, going on in there. And I, I, you know, actually, credit to Frontier on the graphics here. I think I've never noticed. Look, there's shadows and all sorts of things going on in there. Based on where I'm, I'm sort of um, firing my light. So it's you know it's they're growing their own food. It's a self-contained cabbage forever. Yeah, it reminds me of Silent Running. Silent Running is an excellent film. For those of you who haven't seen it, uh, check that out, and you'll see where the inspiration for some of these designs come from. Right, um, Silent Running has exactly this in it, pretty much. Um, so it's a, it's a real trope of science fiction. So uh, a little bit of homage perhaps to um, to to films like that. Right. And then down the side here we have, um, I don't know, maybe storage bays, fuel pods, oxygen supplies. Um, who knows what's in these bits, right? Um, it's like a kind of Mary Celeste in space. There's, you know, very little activity. Very little, there's, you know, we can see windows here. Uh, we can see that there is, there is no activity. Um, everything's dark, so it's all kind of quite disturbing. And this, I'm assuming, is like a carousel. 
as you can see it is no longer rotating and we can only assume that these areas would have been rotating to give you centrifugal force um, or centripetal force should I say um, in order to uh, generate a sort of pseudo gravity, right? Like uh, like the space stations that we still have. That's that's one thing that's a little bit weird in the Elite Dangerous Universe is there is no anti gravity technology. Um, so um, is it rotating or not? Oh, maybe it is. Oh no, it's slowly rotating. Sorry, I, that's my mistake. Um, I probably don't want to sit there then, do I? <laughs> Let me just move out. It's going to rotate around there then because it didn't look like it was rotating. Maybe it is. Maybe it was just from the perspective I was at. So it is. Is it rotating? Oh, it is rotating, yeah, so that's entirely my fault. So yeah, so that is still rotating away at a, a slow rate to generate some 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 uh, centripetal force to generate some gravity, some inertia, right? Um, nice uh, nice way to do that kind of stuff. And there's various other bits and pieces here, and there's, you know, we can see um, interstellar logistics, there's a few names and things on the side of the uh, of the ships, right, of the of these crates, um, which again give you little clues just to but it's it's old tech, right? Low tech stuff. Um, and uh, there are, as you can see, there are some data points. Um, I need to, in order to access these, I need to swap my data links again. That's the one, isn't it? Oops. Uh, my poor code would have I'm going to switch some stuff off. Let's turn that off. Don't need the battery vehicle hanging at the moment, do I? Whoops. Now I've completely knackered things. What did I do there? Um. Oh, I've. That's what I've done. Let's turn those kind of things. Right, yeah, I don't really want to switch my life support off. That would be very bad. Um, let's turn that off. Let's turn that off. I don't need that sort of stuff at the moment. Um, right, so hopefully that's got my data link scanner operational. I think I've got to get quite close to these things. So it's worth it's worth doing these, right? Um, and I'm getting a my scanner off. Oh, the sensors are on. I'm not quite sure why I'm not picking that up. Anyway, never mind. We can do that in a bit. So anyway, so just finishing off our tour of the actual ship itself. Down the bottom end here are the engines, right? Or at least what we assume are engines. And they're massive, right? But there's some sort of low-tech reaction drive, um, you know. And they're long dead, right? Maybe they're out of fuel. Who knows, right? It's. Um, but this is what would have been pushing the ship around, and ultimately, presumably, <laughs> and they're so big that you can fit a Imperial courier inside the uh, the exhaust nozzle. Um, they are they are hugely massive, right? So you know they are they are quite scary uh, in size. I mean, this ship has got to be. Kilometre long, maybe, maybe two kilometres long. It, it's pretty big, right? It's it's not it's not small. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm not getting. I'm getting the generation ship. Why am I getting the? Um, I need to scan the main sensor. Ah, right. So where's where's the main sensor? Um, <laughs> is that at the front here? Donk. I'm just going to find it. I ought to do this. Oh, it's in the middle, right? Okay. Okay. No, no, sorry, that it's in the middle. Right. Scan the whole ship. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, scan the whole ship. Just. Ah, oh, right. Okay. That's how you do it. Ah, oh, there we go. Right. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> someone's got stuck. <laughs> right. So have I got? Have I got a target now? It is spinning very slowly, quite right. Oh, hang on, there's a whole bunch of targets over there. I always find this bit, it's not the easiest thing to, there we go, right. That's the ship of right. Let me go scan these. How many are there? Are there five? Oh, that's the way to do it, yeah. Duh. I'm looking at my contacts. Yeah, I've got them. Right, ship lock, uplink, zero. Right, we'll lock onto that. Let's go get that one. Uh, right, I'm just going to quickly scan these and then we can go and play them. So yeah, so these ships are ancient tech, right? They are properly old things. Is that on this side of the ship or is it on the other 
other side. That's on the other side of the ship. You do have to be a little bit careful navigating around these things, right? Oh, somebody else has got the right idea. There it is up top. Um, so yeah, these are worth doing. So, So that's the first one. Uh, let's get the second one. Plunk. <laughs> so let's just fly around here. So these generation ships are definitely worth exploring. There are quite a few of them. I think there's about 20 or so. Somebody, will, somebody in the chat will tell me um, how many there are. And they were put in game, um, I think, in version 2.2 or 2.3. Of, oh, there are 16. Right, there we go. Um, quite a range. I'm not sure what range is for this. It's going to be further than I want it to be. There we go, that gives you a little pop. We've got to be a bit careful. There's bits of string and all sorts um, here <laughs> holding that dish together. So, okay, I'm just going to try back out the right way. Uh, I'm a bit tangled. Occasionally, the collision detection on the dangerous goes a little bit awry. So, do bear that in mind if you're flying around here. Um, Wegar Law Tours will not be held responsible for any loss or damage to your vessel. <laughs> uh, right, and there's the fourth one. I'm doing amazing here now, I'm not here anyway. That's all good. Right, so there it is. Right, I think I've got off. Right, I'm just going to back off gently. I'll switch to the external camera and then um, we can. Um, so yeah, so 70,000 ships, right, seems just a tad unlikely, really, doesn't it? Yeah, um, so I, I tend to agree with you on that one, but it is it was stated in the original law, so we can't really, we can't really argue with that too much, <laughs> because otherwise we have to get rid of the entire original law, and I don't really want to do that, because there's cool stuff there. Um, so, um, so, that's a, so all of these are launched, right, from the year 2097 onwards, and they colonise most of the rest of what we nowadays call the bubble. Okay, so um, overall, these ships were actually quite successful, right? Okay, so probably maybe 90% plus of them did in fact reach their destinations. Um, quite a lot of them, presumably, just get lost. Some may still be on their way, right? Um, particularly, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, the first one's launched in the 22nd, uh, 21st century, now the 34th century. Some of them could still be in transit, but they'll be much further away from the bubble than um, these ones, right? We don't really know. No more have been found recently. Uh, <laughs> it's just a fallback for the content. Um, yeah, who knows, right? Um, and, um, you yeah, know, so this, this, this is one of many. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a good point actually. We've only got 15 to 20k systems, so maybe you know, maybe a lot of them are still on the move. You know, it's, it's difficult to say. Or maybe there were multiple generation ships going to each planet here. Okay, you can imagine that too potentially. You might have fail safes, right? So it might not be one generation ship per colonizable system. You might see multiple ones. Hopefully, not. hopefully some of them get there, right? Um, uh, so um, yeah, so they're all sent out, right? They're all sent out, and some of them make it and they colonize them, but some of them things go wrong. And that's some of the, the stories that we find on these abandoned generation ships. So let's let's listen to this one. Um, I'm just going to go back and let's let's pick up the story and find out what's going on. So discovered logs. There we go. Um, so 
But this one is, I think, a little bit spooky. This is a very Michael Brooks, you're right. But here we go. Strange whispering noises in the dark. <laughs> we have an emergency situation on board. Some kind of epidemic is driving people insane. I've managed to source it to a digital signal that keeps broadcasting within the comms array. It started on C deck, but now the entire population of deck C to F has been massacred. They just went crazy and started killing each other. Freaky, freaky, <laughs> freaky messages in the depths of this. Where could that be coming from, right? It's so Michael Brooks, it's brilliant. <laughs> Classic, cut it off in a cut it off in static, nice. And the last one. <laughs> it's a dry, really right. Okay, so. <laughs> They're really good, right? I love those. I think they're fantastic. I mean, that is so that is so Michael Brooks is unbelievable, right? <laughs> but really, really good story. Um, it's definitely not. A, it's definitely not a happy one. And to be honest, the vast majority. Um, we were getting some amazing light effects there. The vast majority. The vast majority of the um, generation ship stories are not all that happy, right? Um, we don't know when that recording was made. Actually, yeah, very interesting. Actually, if you look at the timings. And we don't know what they mean, right? It says comms log 905.2.34. You know, it doesn't give us the actual year, right? We don't know where the ship was when it passed this planet that infected them with the weird comms thing. So really difficult to backtrack. But it's got to be somewhere between here and Salt, right? Because that's where it all came from. So, again, uh, if we look at the galaxy map, going back to Salt, right? They've travelled, what was it? It wasn't that far, was it? 
Uh, let's just let's just look onto Sol again. So um, there's Sol, 53 light years away. There's where the ship is now. Now it doesn't necessarily mean it went on the straight line between these two places. We don't know exactly what happened to the ship, right? But maybe one of these planets in between here is is, is where this weird kill the all came from. Who would have done that? Maybe it was sabotage. Right? We don't really know. So. All sorts of all sorts of weird and wacky stuff going on with those uh, with those generation ships, right? So um, yeah, so the ones that we are actually able to see in game, most of them have got really kind of <laughs> freaky stories and stuff. Um, but the most recent one that was discovered, I, I forget exactly where it was, did actually have a, a live crew on board, right? And we were able to talk to them, and we we disembarked them to a planet, which was quite cool. Um, who know? I mean, yeah, who knows, Commander? Well, maybe they'd use gravitational ch string shots and alter the course and plotting their path would be would be would be tricky not impossible because there's only a certain number of things they could have done right but um yeah weird and wonderful stuff um now that's how a lot of the bubble got colonized right who's, who's making my screen go purple <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna keep moving slowly there we go um and um oh well, that'll put you off um so <laughs> you scratched my brain <laughs> um, okay, so generation ships did colonise a lot of the bubble. That's how most of the bubble started out, right? Um, but it was superseded by the invention of hyperspace technology. Hyperspace technology, based on how you read the law, you do have to interpret it a bit, right? You do have to interpret it. But based on the way the law is written, the conflict that we talked about between the Empire and the Federation last uh, yeah, two weeks ago um, appears to have been conducted with ships that were capable of hyperspace in some form or another. Now, whether the jump range was really short, whether the recharge times were really high, whether the complexity of the systems or the reliability of the systems was was poor in these early days, it's impossible to tell. We can only speculate. There is no detail in the law about exactly how the hyperspace tech worked and how it's developed. All we know is that a working hyperspace theory was actually figured out fairly early on in the Elite Dangerous Universe, right? 23rd century, it was discovered that hyperspace was a thing and we could access it, right? But it took a long, long time for us to in, in, industrialize it. Maybe it was really, really bulky technology, you know, um, and, and it's not entirely clear how hyperspace technology works in the Elite Dangerous Universe. I've, I've, I've asked Michael Brooks on, on four separate occasions, I think, at various conventions, is it, is it a wormhole? No, it's not a wormhole. Okay. Is it an Alcubierre warp drive? No, it's not an Alcubierre warp drive. Is it, is it folding dimensions and, and compressing space? No, it's not that one. So I don't actually know what the technology is, even at a kind of lorry level, right? It's hyperspace. It, it's just hyperspace as far as, as the law is concerned. Um, it, <laughs> it's the Roddenberry answer. How, how do the inertial dampeners work? Very well indeed. Um, so, um, so that was, was it. Oh, is it actually in the codex? Has it been updated? Um, okay, let's just, let me just check that. I hadn't realized that. Um, maybe that's been put in since our last look. Let's go and have a look in the codex. Because uh, I don't know everything, right? You know, I'm trying to guide you through the law. Um, let's just check that out. Where's it? Where's it in there? Is it? Where? Where's it in the codex? Um, I was told it wasn't an alcohol. So okay. Uh, where would it be? Is it under one of these categories? Um, so yeah, super cruise is a different thing, right? Super cruise is not the same thing. Super cruise, I think, is an alcohol. But hyperspace isn't right because you're, you're traveling through some other medium. Um, codex is posted, yeah, so maybe it's post -line. So where, where is it in the codex? Can somebody point it to me? Um, I don't know where I would be looking, because there's no search facility, right? This is the 34th century, we don't have search facilities. <laughs> um, somebody will know where, the planet's handbook, is it in there? No. Uh, I'm looking for, for, for where it says Al Cooper we warp drive. Um, mentioned. Um, so, you, so anyway, somebody find it. I'd, I'd be interested to read what it says. We, we, yeah, we can we can update the law. This is this is part of the problem actually with Elite Dangerous, right? And doing a law tour is there have been, and there are still retcons, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, Frontier do keep changing their mind. And I will come across an example. This is Hyperdrive Tech, right? Okay, because I'm going to present to you how it was in the law when it was given to the writers, right? And how it came out of the original Elite Games and all those various other bits and pieces. We're going we're gonna to go through that a little bit, okay? 
Um, so there's, apparently there's no Google in the 34th century. I can't search anything, <laughs> which is really rather irritating. Um, and so, so if somebody can find me anything in there, um, can't find a link to the Kogex page. Um, it, it, it might be in here somewhere. I'll be interested to know, right? Yeah, and we've got these things about the Dark Will and Rexler in here as well. Um, when Super Cruise rather than generating through through the frame shift drive. Um, okay, so yeah, so the frame shift drive is slightly different. Okay, now it's confused a little bit, and I think this was a bit of a mistake actually in the way the game is presented. Um, okay, so the Guardian sticks. Um, so, <laughs> okay, so that's off the, the wiki. Now the frame shift drive, yes. Okay, that's a way of getting around in real space, right? So that's a way of effectively compressing space around, which is effectively how the Alcubierre warp drive works. So it's a type of warp drive. That's the frame shift drive, right? That's got more in common with Star trek style warp drives, okay? So you're traveling in a compressed volume of space um, in order to travel immense distances, and you don't exceed light speed within your own frame of reference. That's sort of the Alcubierre warp drive, right? Okay, so that's the frame shift drive. Now the frame shift drive itself is a relatively new thing. Now what's interesting enough, when I, I'm not going to jump into frame shift at the moment, but when I charge my frame shift drive, right, I get, not surprisingly, um, so I'm just going to do the local, this is low wake, right? I'm not going to jump anywhere, so don't worry, but when I charge it, I get frame shift drive charging, right? I'm going to cancel that. When I jump, uh, when I select my hyperdrive, I want to go somewhere, right? So I've now got hyperdrive locked. When I do that, I get frame shift drive charging. So, is it the same tech or not? Okay, is it the same tech or not? This is not entirely clear. It certainly wasn't the same tech, okay? It certainly wasn't the same tech. So now is the, now is the time for a little bit of a history tour, okay? Now the time for a little bit of a history tour on the hyperspace itself. Um, because we understand from the law, it starts off early on. It appears to have been used for parts of the expansion, so the generation ships themselves become really, really obsolete quite quickly because hyperspace technology takes, you know, slowly takes over. But it takes us, um, it takes us like 600 years to make hyperspace kind of viable, at least in a, in a, in a kind of commercial sense, which seems an awfully long time given how all the other technology in the universe has progressed really, really quickly, right? So um, it's a bit, of, it's a little bit odd. It's a little bit of a mystery. It takes us a long time to get to grips with hyperspace technology. And actually, even today, in Galnet, the, the most recent Galnet article about hyperspace basically says that we still don't really understand how it works. It's a bit of a mystery still. So um, let's explore it from the perspective of the original game. And we'll, we'll find out. Okay, so what I'm going to do, because um, it's my favourite version, and I've done this a little bit on Saturdays, those of you who join me on Saturdays will already know this, but we're going to use the original game for a moment. I'm just going to drop out um, into the original game, the original game. I'm going to use the ZX Spectrum version because I'm familiar with it, but there's no functional difference between it and the, um, the, um, the BBC version. But I'm just more familiar with it, and I've got the emulator on my PC. So I'm just going to fire that up. So we're going to drop. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, we're going to we're going to we're going to jump into 8-bit mode. Okay. <laughs> um, so here it is, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum in all its glory, and I'm just going to switch to a, a, a screen which allows me to take advantage of it completely. There we go. Right, and I have on here uh, Elite. Okay. So again, those of you, yeah, this is this is 8-bit Elite. Okay, we've gone right back in time, uh, and I want to show you a hyperspace jump in this game. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to load a new commander because I don't have one on this account. Uh, that is a Python, by the way. You may have recognized the, uh, you may have recognized the Cobra. Um, and we're going to launch. Right, we are in the Lave system in the original game. And I'm just going to launch out, there's no sound effects. Okay, I'm going to launch out of the station itself. And here we are in space, right? Okay, so, um, and if I turn around, you will notice uh, an astonishing frame rate of at least three or four frames per second. Um, you will notice there is a Coriolis space station. Okay, so it's all nice and familiar, right? So eight bit, eight bit elite, um, and this is a Cobra. You'll notice some similarities with elite, right? So okay, so you've got um, a scanner, you've got a compass, you've got shields, you've got uh, missiles, and all sorts of various other bits and pieces. But what we're going to do is we are going to make a hyperspace jump. 
And I want you to observe this. Okay, we're doing three point sight, six uh, light years jump. Um, I'm going to engage the hyperspace. We get a countdown. We travel through a tunnel. Okay. Okay, and we arrive in another system. Okay, we are now in the Leasty system, and we've used up some fuel. Okay. Okay, so literally no difference. Yeah, exactly right. This is what I was playing in 1984, 85, right? Okay, so um, that was a hyperspace jump. Now, in this era of Elite Dangerous, now this game, the 8-bit game, is set in the year 3125, okay? So it's about 175 years before Elite Dangerous is set, okay? Hyperspace, with this technology on this ship, the Cobra Mark III as it is here, as you can see, is virtually instantaneous. It takes a few seconds to travel through hyperspace to get to your destination. All right? That's quite important. Okay, Cobra Mark III's have been around for a long time. It's a very old ship design. Okay, it's been refitted many times, but it's still an old design. Right? It's been around for a long, long time, many hundreds of years. Uh, which is another weird thing. Okay, we're not used to in our technology. You know, if you had a car like that was three hundred years old, it's just a design. You kind of <laughs> wouldn't expect it to be of any use to anybody at all, right? Because technology would have moved on. But it seems in the Elite Dangerous universe that there are big periods of time where technology doesn't really advance at all for hundreds of years, uh, and we just seem to be static. Okay, so um, and as you can see, we can jump fast. Uh, there seems to be, and it obviously is a gameplay thing, right? But in the law, there's a there's a there's a hard limit of seven light years. You can't exceed seven light years with this, whatever this technology is. You can't exceed it. Okay, um, and that's the first time we see hyperspace in the universe of elite, actually visually. Okay, so that that's that's the technology. Now bear that in mind. Hyperspace, quick through some sort of tunnel to the you know the opposite opposite location. Right. So that's that's that. Now some of you will know. I'm just going to do this for your delectation of delight because I almost certainly won't survive this, right? Um, I'm going to do something that you can't do in Elite Dangerous. It's called a misjump, okay? Uh, I'm just going to reset the game because I need the fuel to do it. Um, so apologies for that. So I'm going to just go back to the start. Uh, that's the Cobra Mark III once more. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I am going to um, do what, exactly what I did before. I'm just going to launch from the station. <laughs> Um, and as you can see, the leaving the uh, space station is exactly the same as hyperspace, but yeah, saving on memory and all that kind of kind of stuff, right? Uh, so there we go. I'm going to stop now. On the Spectrum version and on the BBC version and various other versions of this 8-bit game, you can. It's kind of like a debug mode, but it's kind of like a hidden cheat, right? You can force a missed jump, okay? Um, or is it a high prediction? Who knows, right? Okay, so watch what happens when I force a missed jump. I'm going to pause the game. I'm going to put it into a special mode by pressing F. Uh, I think it's F. Is it F? Uh, I thought it was F. I usually get a beep noise from it. That's weird. I'm pretty sure it was F. I'm not hearing the beep. Why am I not hearing the beep? In fact, I've lost the ship. I've lost entirely lost the lost the game as well. <laughs> I think I may have crashed it. Let's try that again. <laughs> It's always a live, live environment, right? Okay, let's try that again. Maybe I need to have the hyperspace locked. I'm just gonna try that again. Hang on a minute. Uh, okay, so, right, let's try locking on target. Uh, right, I've got hyperspace locked. If I wanna pause the game. Uh, oh, no, the game. Why is the game crashing on me? It's not supposed to do that. Let me try it one more time. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. A bit annoying. Could be because I'm running like six billion machine things on my machine at the moment. Um, it should allow me to do this. Because I want to show you a misjump, right? Because you can't do it in Elite. Uh, Elite Dangerous. Uh, right, so that's pause. Uh, it's crashing on me. This is annoying. That's really a shame. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, let me just try a save that I've got on here. Maybe that will help. So let's try that again. Right, ah, there we go. Right, this might be working. Okay, right. All right, we've got it back. Now, what I've done is I've put the game into like a kind of debug mode. What should happen here is I should get into hyperdicted something, right? Let's find out what happens. And I, I might have to demonstrate some 8-bit skills, okay? So we're in hyperspace. Um, 
And a bit of luck. Yes, we have been hyperdicted. This is this is eight bit hyperdiction, right? I'm gonna see how I do. In fact, I've got crappy guns on this ship, so I'm unlikely to survive this. These are the original Thargoids, right? Come on, can I kill one on stream? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm gonna ram it. Oh, I got away. I'm almost dead. Energy low. Oh, there's the ship. Come back, come back, come back, come back. It's quite hard to do this because I've got no yaw control, right? So let's get after it. Maximum throttle. In fact, I'm. The problem is, if my energy runs out, I'm gonna get one. I'm dead. <laughs> I should have landed my Saturday ship. Yeah, now you have to come on the Saturday stream to watch it. But anyway, so that, that's a missed job in the original game, right? So that's enough of that, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so let's just go back. So what that was, right? Okay, partly, um, partly um, about the um, um, obviously the Thargoids, right? Um, in that, we'll talk about the Thargoids later on. But um, you could miss jump in the original game. And this is where the idea of witch space comes from. You may have heard this phrase, right? Witch space, as distinct, at least a bit, from hyperspace, okay? So wh where does this all come from, right? Where does this all come from? Um, because in the original manual, it gets described as hyperspace is a strange environment uh, which we travel through in order to get to our destination, right? Um, and it's weird stuff can happen in hyperspace, okay, or witch space as it's referred to in the original Elite game. Uh, and it's called witch space because basically the, the, the novel that comes with it is, starts off with a line, some say witch space is haunted. Some say uh, it's haunted by the ghosts of the ships that first went in, but never came out, okay? So witch space, what is witch space? And it's not entirely clear, right? Um, some people will insist, I think they're wrong, <laughs> some people will insist that in those 8-bit games, right, the place that you ended up with the Thargoids was witch space. Um, but according to these, the map, you're just in interstellar space in between two areas, right? So it's just normal space, but you just happen to be in between stars. So you drop out between the stars, and that's where the Thargoids grab you. Um, I've always considered um, that which space is that tunnel, okay? Which space is the tunnel that you fly through, and it's got weird stuff going on in it. Now, I feel I was kind of, this was sort of confirmed. When we first see Elite Dangerous Hyperspace, right, it's got weird stuff going in it, right? Now, that looks like stars and nebulae and stuff flying past, right? But it can't be stars and nebulae flying past, because even if you do a short jump, to a star which you can see, I know there's nothing really in between you and it, right? You still see that stuff. So in the law, you're traveling through some place to get to your destination, right? Um, and it's it's a tunnel through something. And I think that is witch space as, as it's portrayed in the original game. Um, so we see in the, in the year, um, 3125, which is where the original game is set, that we're traveling through something, okay? And um, <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe, it's like, maybe it's like the infinite improbability drive, right? Um, we're not, not entirely sure, but in that era, we have fast hyperspace travel. Now, something slightly weird happens. I'm just gonna go and get, because this is quite important. I'm just gonna get my original copy of Elite, right? And just show you the section. So excuse me for a moment, I'm just gonna pull the universe aside and go and get it. So here we have my my prized copy, right, of the original game. And it comes with its manual. And it has a section on hyperspace. Um, and uh, making for other worlds, here we go. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful manual, this. You know, it's full of cool details. It's even got the star map in it and you know all sorts of kind of good stuff. Right, so um, leaving the space station, there we go, right. Making for your target world. Um, and there's there's various other bits and pieces in here. 
Uh, right, now the bit I want is probably actually in the dark wheel itself. Let me just go and double check this. Um, so this talks about um, something here, okay? Um, and I'll, read, I'll read some little excerpts. This is from the original Dark Wheel, okay? So this is the book that set the tone for the Dangerous Universe in the background, okay? So um, they're, they're, they're in their ship, they've launched from a space station, and they get a voice from the space station saying, Enter faraway jump, remember the word faraway, along channel 27 at 45 Orient. So you have to align your ship to get into hyperspace, okay? Um, there's an impending transit through hyperspace, making a faraway jump. Again, that word. In a system as complex and crowded as lave is no simple business. A hundred eyes are watching you make a mistake and you won't be welcome when you come back. Okay? Um, so that's that's important. Okay? Um, you're gonna maybe cover seven light years in a few minutes, right? So it's in the law, right? You were able to cover uh, you uh where we go, there we go. Just gonna point it to the camera. This is important, right? Um there you go. Hopefully you can see that, right? Uh, you're going to cover maybe seven light years in a few minutes. Now you might think that's a lot of space to get lost in, but that's not how it works. All right, far away is a tunnel, like any other tunnel, and inside that tunnel is the realm called Witch Space, a magic place, a place where the normal rules of the universe don't necessarily work. Every few thousand parsecs along the Witch Space Tunnel, there are monitoring satellites, branch lanes and stop points and rescue stations, passing by all of those uh, and performing perhaps 100 channels, 100 lines for ships to travel, each one protected against two dangers of hyperspace travel, atomic reorganisation and time displacement. Jump on your own through hyperspace across more than half a light year, you'll be lucky enough to make the same universe, let alone your destination. Okay. So, um, now, that's a bit weird, okay? So it's, it's talk, it talks about witch space having monitoring stations and automated switch points and like a, it's like a railroad, okay? It's got like switches and sidings and all sorts of channels and things that you can travel through. And that had to be built, okay? That had to be built. Now, it's in the law of Elite Dangerous, okay? So, some of you may be thinking, no, no, it's all been retconned. Well, mm, yes and no, okay? Let me show you, let me show you. Uh, over here, so I'm just going to pop up the Galnet Law on hyperspace. Here it is. Okay, so I'm just going to—I may have to zoom this up so you guys can read it. Um, uh, where's my where's my zoom on my browser? There we go. Let's just zoom that up a tiny bit. Okay, it's 150 percent. There we go. So Galnet News. This is from yeah you know, three years ago now, but uh, continuing our popular series on significant episodes from human history. Hyperspace technology originated in the 22nd century, okay? Uh, but it wasn't until the 2800s that consumer ships began to take advantage of it. So there's a, there's a big gap before we can take advantage of it, right? Um, first commercially available hyperspace system was known as the Far Away Jump. That's where it comes from, right? Um, the, si the Far Away system was far from perfect, however, depending on the complex network of monitoring satellites, branch lines, stop points, and rescue stations. Lifted straight out of here, okay? So it's still canon. All those of you who say, no, it's been retconned. No, it hasn't. Well, at least not all of it, right? A lot of stuff in here is still canon. Um, some believe that which space... Right, okay, I'll go on, jump first. It took hundreds of years to establish. It's in the law. It's on Galnet. Okay, can't argue with that. It's in-game. This was in-game. You can't obviously get to Galnet anymore, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so somewhere in between the 22nd century and 2800, somebody constructed... Satellites, branch lines, stop points, and rescue stations, a hyperspace network, okay, that we could travel through. Something that you had to, you couldn't hyperspace without it, right? It's like um, catching a train. You had to kind of, you know, get on the hyperspace <laughs> express or something. Um, it was around that time that the phrase witch space first appeared, reflecting an inherent dangers of early hyperspace technology in the strange corridor a ship travelled through during a hyperspace jump. Some even believe witch space was haunted by ghosts of ships that went into the far away and didn't come out again. And it's certainly true that a number of ships never reached their destinations. Right? Okay. So, so far so cool. 
The original hyperdrives were powered by a fuel known as Querium, the formula of which has a closely guarded secret, and the formula was lost. Okay. Now, we'll get to why the formula was lost when we talk about Galcop, because Galcop is the organization that managed the hyperspace network, as it was back then. Um, somewhere between, you know, 2800 and 3100, um, is the era that Galcop was was presiding, and that's where the, the hyperspace mechanism was designed. Um, now, that organization collapsed. Galcop, the organization that existed politically around the time of the original Elite game, is in the Elite Dangerous Law, but it's gone. It's a collapsed organization, and it had a whole bunch of advanced technology like that hyperdrive system that we saw in the 8 bit version of the game that no longer exists. The secret to it was lost. We don't know how that, that hyperdrive mechanism worked. That, and by the time of the original game, right, by the time of the original game that we were, the 8 bit game we were playing, you could hyperspace anywhere you liked. You no longer needed the you know, the lanes and the branch things and all the satellite stations, your ship was self-contained by 3125, okay? So the faraway jump system was replaced. The faraway jump system was replaced by autonomous hyperdrive mechanisms. Now, I did a bit of analysis on this many moons ago, and this is what I came up with, okay? Uh, and this has now been archived. Now, I'm not entirely sure anymore whether this is considered canon or not. I, uh, th I, I want to leave you with something to, to chew over on this. Um, now, my law articles have been um, archived by Canon Research, okay? So you can go and read them. If you just try Drew Wager Hyperspace Law or something like that, you'll find it, okay? Your Google, your Google will find it, right? So I came up with this. Circa 2800 AD, the faraway jump system is put into operation. It seems to have branch lines and stop points and all sorts of things. I called it hyperspace type zero. Okay, this is just my, I made this up, right? Just for my own basics, yeah. Um, then, um, and it was noted, here's, here's, a little, here's a little aside about the Thargoids. Thargoid ships were able to hover in witch space and potentially ambush ships coming through. Okay, so that's something that hyperspace, that the Thargoids could do. Um, we don't know exactly when this new type of hyperspace, this autonomous hyperspace, was invented. It's based on curium fuel. That's that's out of here, right? I, I went and mined this for the information on that, and it's in the in the original leak manual too. So that original hyperspace then became compartmentalized, commercialized. You could put it on a ship. Notably, your ship had to be a certain size. Okay, a Cobra Mark III was capable of holding a hyperdrive system, right, in this area. But a Sidewinder, another ship that did exist back then, wasn't big enough. You couldn't put a hyperspace drive on a Sidewinder, okay, in this era. The ships were too too small. So there was a, there was still a size limitation. The Cobra Mark III was one of the smallest ships that you could equip a hyperdrive module onto, right? Um, that's why it became such a popular ship, because it was, it was the smallest ship where you, that you could still do useful stuff with. The, the Sidewinder had to be carried through hyperspace by a bigger ship, like an Anaconda or something. Um, so, this technology was very fast, right? This technology was very, very fast. Uh, you could only take a few minutes to do your hyperspace jump. You could only travel seven light years, right? Um, the, the fuel, Quirium, we have no idea what it was. Um, and um, there were, um, you know, the, but the transit was fast, right? The transit was fast. This was all the Galcop era um, technology, right? Um, and this, whatever this was, has been lost in the Elite Dangerous Law. The secret to this hyperspace technology has been lost. Because, and we know this, because 75 years later is when the second game in Elite Dangerous is, you know, comes upon us and starts contributing to the law. So let's pop over to that. Uh, and we're gonna have to go into 16-bit era now. Um, so uh, here we go. <laughs> we're now, into something called DOSBox, okay? So this is emulating a PC from 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, and I'm just gonna mount, I'm gonna do some slightly techy stuff here. Um, uh, do. Right, users. Okay, right, so I'm gonna switch to C drive. CD document, I think it's that. 
Yeah, CD games. Okay, and CD Frontier. Now I've got working copies of the original games on my PC, right? Okay, so <laughs> a bit like your current PC, yeah. Um, let's let's load up. This is the second game in Elite Dangerous. Now I have to tell you which sound card I'm using. So here we go. This is the second game. Okay. Um, so you know, graphics technology has moved on a little bit. Okay. Um, so we're now we're now playing Frontier Elite Two, um, which came out for the PC, came out for the Amiga, and the Atari ST. So for those of you who are into your retro stuff will remember this from years and years and years ago. Now, um, I just need to uh, up the processor power of my um, pretend PC. Uh, apologies for the, the music. Actually, there's a, a lovely uh, uh, instrumental versions of this that are worth checking out on YouTube. Because this theme tune is actually really good. It just sounds a bit happy, this little 16-bit um, sound card emulation. But um, there we go. Anyway, so it was quite cool. Again, you can see how graphics technology has moved on in the intermediate years. This is about 10 years later than the 8-bit version, okay? And this is actually the original Imperial Courier, which back then was a really kind of uber, uber spaceship. So it's quite cool. Planetary landings, okay? Um, with atmospheres, atmospheric planetary landings were a thing back in 1993. Um, have yet to be bettered in some ways. You know, bridges and towns and cities and all sorts of stuff. Very cool. Anyway, I get distracted. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start here. I've even got a mouse, look, this is really cool. Um, I'm gonna start, there we go. <laughs> I know the sky's pink, but you know there's a there's a there's a nice gas jump. What we're going to do is I'm going to just show you our hyperspace jump in this game because I need you to check something out. Notice the date; it's the first of January, 3200. We're now 75 years on from the previous game. We actually have a date in the game, which also helps. Um, now I need to phone up and get a launch request. Uh, have I got fuel on board? Actually, let me just double check that. Uh, I don't think I do. No, there's not. There's cargo space one new so i've got atmospheric i've got automatic part and atmospheric shield and that's all i've got i need to buy some fuel now this is an interesting thing for this game 75 years later we now have the federation and the empire in the law okay we now have the federation and the empire in the law they exist on the galactic map and so on and so forth but that hyperspace technology has been lost federation and imperial hyperspace technology is way way inferior to whatever it was that we had in the gal copy and that has been lost they're using a different type of hyperspace technology, right? So uh, I just need to go to the stop and I need to buy, because it doesn't run on this weird curium fuel anymore, it runs on pure hydrogen. So I have to buy a ton of hydrogen fuel. Oh, I've actually got one on board, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, in order to get my ship to work, okay? So then I need to request launch, and then I need to launch, and then I think, I'm kind of hoping it's mouse control. It's not there. I can't remember what the controls are. I thought it was mouse control. Oh yeah, this is mouse control. There we go. It's it's right mouse click for reasons. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to accelerate us off the planet. Uh, you've got a few cool things here, like we've got external views. Uh, there we go. I need to put the undercarriage up. Um, and some stuff like that. Yeah, amazing sound effects as you can see. There's my, there's my. This is actually an eagle, uh, eagle mark one. I think this is in this this version of the game. Um, and we've got clouds, and it's all very pretty, right? And there's a couple. I think there's a couple of missiles underneath, right? So anyway, now you've got this thing here called the Star Dreamer, which becomes important in a bit. I'm just going to. It basically allows us to speed up time, okay, from the perspective of of where we are. Um, and I'm just going to get us out into space then that allows us to do a hyperspace jump. We don't actually technically have to do it, but you can see, um, there we go, we're now out in space. We've gone out of the atmosphere and we're exhilarating weight and um, we're in space. Space is blue for, 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 for reasons that have never ever been adequately explained at this time in the Elite Dangerous Universe. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> There was it was a it was a big deal. There's some, something about space being blue. Um, I'm not quite sure what it was. But anyway, right, so we go and jump on our let's just set the time back to there all right let's do a quick jump to i don't know can we go there ellipse on indy right uh my hyperspace indicator shows that i'm i'm over k to jump so i'm just going to show you this jump now notice the time this is really important what's the date okay it is nine minutes past 12 we've been flying the game for nine minutes of time right it's the first of january 3200 okay um, I am going to then initiate the hyperspace jump um, by 
Maybe that one's out of range. Oh, it's out of range. Hang on, I've got to go somewhere. There we go. I can go wherever that is. Um, Octurus. Yeah, let's go. Well, let's go to Octurus, right? There we go. I've selected Octurus. I go back here. I'm ready to do a hyperspace jump. Watch the time. This bit here. This bit of the screen here, right? Okay. Um, watch. Hyperspace jump. And I'm just going to pause the game at that point and get rid of the really annoying music that happens. Oh, God. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, pause. Look at the date. Look at the date. Okay. It took us... Oh, annoying sound. Okay, let's just set the engines to zero. There we go. Right, there we go. Okay, right, pause. Um, <laughs> look at the date, right? January the 7th. It took seven days for us to travel through hyperspace to a destination that was... Okay, where did we come from? We were there. Okay, seven light, seven light years. Okay, six days, ten hours, someone's worked it out. Okay, so hyperspace in this era, 100 years before the time of Elite Dangerous, is incredibly slow. Okay, and it's only that Star Dreamer time compression technology that makes it bearable. It takes you seven days to travel through hyperspace. Okay, now this was actually, yeah, you know, for the games perspective, quite a cool dynamic because what you could do is you could upgrade your hyperdrive and make your ship go through faster, relatively. And you could actually ambush ships that were slower. So if you could get a wake scan right of a ship going into hyperspace. You could work out where it was going and when it was going to arrive. And if your ship was faster, you could jump to the same place and get there before it did and wait and ambush it when it came out, which was a really cool thing to be able to do, actually. Um, so um, what's not entirely clear here is, is, is exactly that command and terraform. Is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it experience time for the pilot or is it time? Di it's in the law. It's not entirely clear, but it seems that there's always a date, right? There's always a date indicated. So it appears to be... Um, elapsed time and um, whether the pilot just sort of lowers himself into the chair and presses a wake me up in seven days button and there's like a stasis mechanism aboard the ship um, that seems to be supported in the law there's a there's a there's a there's a technique there's a there's a thing called solastoplaston which is a ghastly name but it's a technology that deals somehow deals with inertia and deals with time compression and various other bits and pieces and the star dreamer is the technology that's on board these ships in order for you to to make um, yeah, to deal with this weird time dilation, right? Okay. Now, the the blue weird thing that you're seeing in the background is the hyperspace exit. You leave behind a sort of uh, glowing sphere when you exit hyperspace, and you know, you can scan when you've got a properly equipped ship. You can scan it for information and stuff. Okay. So that's how the hyperspace works in this era. Now, here's another thing. Okay. So that's hyperspace. Hyperspace is slow, um, and it runs on hydrogen by this point in time. Okay, now here's the other thing, right? Um, notice where we are. This doesn't work like the Elite Dangerous Hyperdrive at all. Okay, we've not come out near the star. In fact, we've come out almost as far away from the star as it's possible to be. Uh, let me show you if I can remember how to do it. Uh, that one. There we go. Right, so there's, there's Octurus. Um, and actually, uh, we are... There we go. Oh, that's there. Great user interface. Uh, those are the planets in the system. And we are... We are we're, we're miles out, right? Okay, we're not even on the scanner. Uh, so if we want to go somewhere, let's, let's set the target to this, this planet here, right? Uh, I'm going to click on the autopilot button. Um, and it's going to fly us there, right? Oh, the blue point is us. Okay, so that's where we are. Right? So we come out in a random location in the solar system. Um, doesn't wish show up, which is a bit... We're sort of off the plane of the galaxy as well. We're there, look, in a kind of totally random place. Um, so I've set the auto part to go there. Now, when I click engage, uh, which I've forgotten how to do, really. Oh, I think I've switched off the lock. So, I can't target. There we go. That's quite locked. Uh, why am I not moving? Oh, I've got to click here. Engines off, autopilot engage. Right, so the ship will now fly itself. Okay. Um, um, so uh, 
yeah, I'm looking in the wrong direction. But now we're flying towards our destination. It's 12 AUs away. Now notice, at this point in the original game, we'd have used the um, jump drive to get there fast. In Elite Dangerous, we'd engage the frameship drive to get there fast. In this area of Elite, there is no frameshift drive, okay? The ship has to do it manually, in real space, okay? So, uh, fortunately, you know, this will take a lot long time, right? Okay? Uh, I know, autopilot, what is this lost technology? <laughs> This is this is the stuff that's not consistent in the whole law, right? It's, it's, you know, there's autopilots and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, all sorts of weird things going on, right? Uh, so I have to speed up time. That's the only way to do it. That's what the Star Dreamer is, right? Okay, so we're going to accelerate time to maximum here. Now watch the time go past. 8th of January. Okay. And it's taken us to... 9th of January. There we go. Uh, it's now... Halfway through the 9th of Jan, we're, we're closing on target. Oh, now the ship's under attack. <laughs> Typical. Um, this might kill us, actually. Um, but anyway, you can see, I'm just going to pause it because we might get shot to pieces. Um, let's just turn the engines off. It's exciting stuff, isn't it? There we go. There we go. Let's go pause it there. Um, travel through the solar system in this era, in 3200, is just using main engines right okay so you have to thrust your way there and then slow down halfway through and then and decelerate right it takes you days to get from the edge of wherever your hyperspace into to the destination you're going to so not only does hyperspace take several days once you've arrived in the system it takes you several days of, of time to get to the destination right um, so this technology from a law perspective is 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 way more primitive than what we had 75 years before with Galcop, okay? So Galcop had some cool technology and they, when they collapsed, the secret was lost. And then all that's left is this type of technology, right? Which is slow, but has much greater jump ranges than before, okay? So that's, that's, that's how we end up with. And it hasn't changed for many years. So again, I'm gonna just close this down. Um, I can be about to get out of this game. Uh, let's see, control Q, exit, uh, shift Q. No, Alt X, Shift X, something. Can't even remember how to get out of it. <laughs> Let me kill it. Um, there we go. Zip. Uh, right. Let me show you the next game. Okay. I won't show it for very long because I don't need to. But um, it's just for consistency and, and you know for people watching after the event. Uh, I'm just going to start DOSBox again. Right. So here we have. Uh, I should have done that. Users slash true. Uh, the one because we haven't got long file name support at this point in the in, in the in the law of PCs. Um, we have FFE here and FFE first ink. Okay, so this is the third elite game. Okay, and this only came out two years after the previous one, so it's not really that much different. And there's a whole old story about this which we're not going to get into now about uh, whether this really was a new game or whether it was actually an expansion pack or stuff anyway but we're not getting there today you can see the graphics have improved a little bit but not like hugely and this is this is 1995 now um, crucially here apart from really dodgy music again let's just switch that off because <sighs> it's really bad um, and let's start a new game Turn the music off, right? Okay, so the UI has changed a little bit, but um, what you'll notice here is that the technology is exactly the same. Okay, so in the law, the hyperspace jump, the mechanism to get into the system, has um, has not changed. Okay, you notice the time is now 3250, so we're now only 50 years away from the period of Elite Dangerous. Hyperspace technology is still ultra primitive. Okay. So that's just a, that's just a little segue. So going back to where we are in uh, where's my mouse? I've lost my mouse. Got me now. Oh, my dust box is open. That's why. Captures the mouse, right? It's really irritating. <laughs> so back here. Right. So um, we we're, we're still here. Thank you for all for for hanging around, right? Um, uh, in fact, let's just turn around and we'll we'll head back in convoy. I think I've just wandered. I've left <laughs> the engines running, haven't I? Um, so now we're uh, miles and miles away from where we were. Where's the actual, um, 
<laughs> completely lost the um, um, the generation ship. It's over there somewhere, but there we go. Never mind. Um, so um, yeah. So what happened? Okay, what happened? Well, let's go back to my little version of the law over here. Okay, so here's here's the cloud technology. So hyperspace type one I call Querium, right? The, the, the original game vibes. Hyperspace cloud or cloud technology, hyperspace type 2B technology is what I called it originally. Um, we lost Querium, we had to use this this new mechanism, right? Um, now, that's good. We got expanded jump range, which unlocks the galaxy for us, but it's um, uh, it's slow, and there are a few variations on it. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, and then in the law, in the year 3290, um, this frame shift drive mechanism is discovered, right? Um, so a fast, I, you know, basically this is based on information that I kind of gleaned out of writing for, for Elite Dangerous. In the late 3290s, a fast hyperdrive mechanism that immediately makes those old jumps, old jump drive technologies obsolete, right? Um, and it was researched, and you'll find this in, in Galnet if you go back far enough, by a ship called uh, the Starship Antares, or Antares, Antares. Okay, so it was a ship um, that tried this new style technology jump drive and actually was you know, destroyed, right? Okay, so it was a bit, a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, and, um, but it was so much more effective because it not only somehow gave you fast hyperspace and extended range but also brought you back to that Galcop era speed of hyperspace travel you could then almost instantly get to your destination which totally revolutionizes hyperspace travel in the year 3290 right um, and then um, um, as you can see this explain and this is this is my rationale for why a lot of the ships from the elite 2 and elite 3 game do not appear in elite dangerous is that you know you can't necessarily, you know, they're basically made, being made obsolete overnight, okay? It's like a horse and cart suddenly being replaced by the internal combustion engine. The new hyperspace is so effective that it wipes out all the, um, you know, all the old tech. And nobody needs it anymore, because why would you keep it? Because it's useless, right? Frame shift drive is making things much faster. You can now travel from a space station in one system to a space station in the other system in a matter of minutes, whereas it used to take two weeks, okay? So why wouldn't you, okay? So all the other technology is effectively gone. Now, um, that is all based on the original law and original uh, information and, you know, extracts from all the various different manuals that took me to, to took all those kind of things in. Now, interesting enough, I wrote this, I can't remember exactly when I wrote this, but I certainly wrote it many years ago, right? Um, and I put a little bit at the end here, just just for a bit of fun in some ways. Even after all this time, hyperspace is not still well is well understood. The witch space tunnel that's traversed still hosts inexplicable lights and structures within it, and it seems hyperspace will hold its mysteries and lore for centuries to come. Perhaps witch space really is haunted. Of course, this was before hyperdictions and all that kind of stuff. So there's some weird stuff going on. Now, interestingly enough, and read into this what you will, <laughs> I wrote that, and it was online for maybe three or four months. And I've got, you know, none of this is, these, these naming conventions here are not official, okay? This, is, this, is, this was my reference, hyperspace type 0, hyperspace type 1, type 2B, um, and, you know, I've called frameshift drive hyperspace type 3. And it's just really my mnemonic, okay? Um, then, a few, a, a few months later, to be fair, a few months later, um, this, 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 this article here appeared. Uh, and it's interesting, and it talks about Curium, and then halfway down, <laughs> that appeared. <laughs> um, and I remember reading this thinking, oh, that's interesting. Where, where did they get that from? <laughs> um, so, um, and a few, a few bits of bits and pieces of this text. I mean, it's been rewritten, right? But it's. Um, um, <laughs> if I was being a little bit cruel, right, I, I would say that somebody at Frontier had gone, oh, that's quite good. <laughs> Let's rewrite that and pinch it and turn it into Galnet for the week. Um, that may be being a bit unfair because obviously they're working from some of the same material. But I'd never seen 2B, Type 2B, appear in anything official, right? Um, so when I saw that, I was like, oh, hey, a minute, what's going on here? And then I went down today, right? And then look at this last paragraph, right? Um, so I wrote, 
Even after all this time, hyperspace is still not well understood. Okay? Even today, hyperspace remains poorly understood. <laughs> the witch space tunnel that's traversed still hosts inexplicable lights and structures within it. Um, many pilots have reported glimpsing inexplicable lights and even structures within the witch space tunnel. And then, it seems hyperspace will hold its mysteries in law for centuries to come. Perhaps witch space really is haunted. It may be centuries before all of its mysteries are unraveled. Well, it's not the same, right? It's it's kind of like kind of like we've got an essay off the internet and changed some of the words and then passed it off. So I may be being totally unkind. It may be it may be a complete coincidence. But anyway, so um, when I read that, I remember thinking I remember chuckling to myself, thinking I wonder if they've <laughs> you know, I I'd put this together really mostly for my benefit and a few people got onto it. So um, it seems it's sort of sort of a bit become. <laughs> bit become law and maybe a bit not so but type 2b is in there right so um and that's that's something that i invented but it sort of got canonized by, by galnet um you know in january 3303 so um totally a coincidence <laughs> totally a coincidence um so there we go um but what this does say is it basically does back up my unofficial explanation which is there was a faraway jump system that got made obsolete by the Querium system, um, which was a closely guarded secret. And then we lost that technology. Um, the Type 2B proved very popular. Um, and then we talk about the hyperspace cloud that you saw in the games. And then in the late 3290s, a new hyperspace mist system emerged that rendered those drives obsolete. And now we have um, the... The, yeah, the, the modern frameship drive system. Now, uh, I called it Type 3, as you can see here, and then it replaced the Type 2B. And I can't remember why I called it Type 2B. I think a lot of you asked, why, what happened to Type 2A? <laughs> well, I, 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 I can't even remember now my rationalization for calling it 2B. Um, but <laughs> I think I did it to make it sound sort of like there was a variant that didn't work or something like that. I can't even remember now. But, um, um, <laughs> whoever it was that wrote this Galnet article, and it wasn't me, I promise. Um, um, <laughs> obviously, just took it and went with it, right? Uh, so, so there we go. Okay, so it's it's yeah, so that's how the that's how the hyperspace has evolved. So there was a system that was designed from the sort of twenty eight hundreds onwards um, that had branch lines and switchbacks and all sorts of stuff in it. And then it was replaced by this Querium hyperspace drive that we see in the original 8-bit games, um, which was fast but had a 7 light year limit. Then that's lost, that secret is lost. Um, and um, the Federation and the Empire have an inferior version of hyperspace, which takes a long time to get anywhere, okay? Which is why Galcop, there's a lot of tension between Galcop and the Federation and the Empire, which we will get to, right? Uh, that's going to be a topic for next week. Um, and. Um, you had to have that time compression technology and all sorts of other bits and pieces to deal with the fact it was just took an awfully long time to get anywhere. And then 2090, as the new game starts, right, 10 years effectively in the timeline before the new game starts, radical new technology is 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 derived from somewhere. Um, and um, it's tested out on this ill-fated starship Antares. You can look that up in the law, that's quite interesting. Um, and then the Type 2B hyperspace drive is, is gone, it's obviously, along with a whole bunch of ships that yet used it, right? They were never retrofitted. Um, and, um, you know, now you can jump way, way further, way, way fast. You can jump things, um, um, you, know, uh, you know, much, much quicker than you could before. So, anyway, <laughs> oh, I'm not quite sure what happened with, you know, between my article and the, uh, the official Galnet one, but um, there we go. I'll leave you to speculate on that one. Uh, it made me chuckle at you. Like. Um, now, the interesting thing about all this, right, the interesting thing about this is the bubble, okay? What used to be called the core world, but the bubble as it is, you know, you, you guys all call it the bubble. I was, it was, yeah, not quite where the bubble came from, actually, in, you know, as a thing. But uh, what it means is, you know, an, an area of space, right? A, a, a bubble, right? Now, um, if we have a look, I'm just going to zoom out here. I'm going to switch on the power play. I remember how to do it. There it is. Um, okay, I'm going to switch on the power play. There you go. So there, there's power play, right? Okay. And uh, yeah, we are. Where are we? We're kind of 
in the top corner of it. Uh, I'm just trying to get a, a feel for here. So if I choose a system down here, um, it is, oh, let's just zoom in on that one. I'm just going to get a rough estimation, right, for the diameter of this bit. Okay, so that is telling me the distance. If I just get back to realistic mode. Okay, it's about 200 light years there. So the, the, the bubble, or at least the power play environment, is probably about 350, maybe 400 light years across. Okay, the pill was late. Yes, yeah, so it was the pill in Alpha. I remember that. Um, um, I remember the pill. Um, so let's say the power play area is about 200, maybe 350 light years in diameter, right? If we go to the map and we switch on, um, you know, we can see here the inhabited systems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch. On, I'm going to switch this to. Uh, there we go, and switch off the nuns, right? So here we can see how far does the inhabited bubble stretch, right? It stops about there, and it stretches a fair away, okay? But then it stops quite abruptly, right? So that's the bubble, right, uh, in, in my head, right? It's probably maybe f maybe six, 700 light years in diameter. It's not super huge, right? It's not super huge. And that's the established area of humanity okay um, and that's maybe seven eight hundred light years across now when your ship right when your ship takes I don't know, a week to do a seven light year jump you can see that jumping across something this big um, is, is is a bit of an undertaking right travel across the bubble pre elite dangerous drive right would take you you know, it would take you months, possibly even years, right? So exploration and, and just general trade was a big deal. In fact, if you wanted to go, you know, if you were the Federation and you wanted to go invade some empire systems, right, you know, it would take you some time to do it, okay? Um, and you'd have to build up a fleet and you'd have to have staging points and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, now, today we have ships that can travel. And what's the, what's, I mean, tell me, tell me, what's the maximum jump range you can achieve? Not, not counting... Um, you know, neutron star boosts and all that stuff and jumponium, but just, just straight hyperspace jump range, right? Um, I mean, you're talking 60, 70, 80 light years? I mean, what's the upper limit on an anaconda without assistance nowadays? Um, 82, there we go. Okay, so 82 light years, 70, 82. 82 is the maximum jump range, right? What that means is, with the, with the Elite Dangerous era ships, right, is the bubble is totally, non totally meaningless, right? Because you can go anywhere in the bubble within half an hour, right? <laughs> It's 800, even if it's 800 light years across, that's 10 jumps for a, for a ship of that kind. Okay, and it's going to be a bit slower when you fill it up with fuel and cargo space and stuff. And yeah, but you can, yeah, the point is made, right? You can travel across the bubble in a matter of hours now. Um, now, that should have changed the political structure of the galaxy, you know, utterly. Okay, a technology like that should completely blow the bubble apart because prior to the, prior to Elite Dangerous, any kind of military, can, any kind of um, invasion would have required resources to be built up over weeks and months and years and da 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 da, right? Whereas with this new hyperspace technology, you know, the sky's the limit. The, the old boundaries no longer make any sense because you can just circumvent them, right? Um, territories don't really make any sense because you can go around them. You know, there's no choke points anymore because you can just go around the back and so, apart from permit locks, right? I and mean, that's another topic. Um, so, you know, this technology should have made a massive reorganization of politics as well. We don't kind of don't see that. One of the things I always found a bit frustrating about power play is like, why the hell would humanity keep arguing about this this bubble of stuff when we can just literally um, we can literally just go away <laughs> and colonize vast tracts of the galaxy, right? And just just go out there. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Uh, why why are you fighting around here when there's loads of resources around the outside? Law wise, it kind of a, it's a bit confusing, but it, it basically shows you the the total and utter revolution that the frameship drive should have been, right? Uh, and 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 has to be in the law. That's that's kind of really really important. So um, that hyperspace technology is is, is weird, right? Um, now let's do a hyperspace jump. Let's let's just jump across to where should we go? Hang on a minute. Uh, I'm just thinking. Where's me? There we are. Uh, uh, come back here. 
Um, I've got a list of the generation ships up here. Let's go to, while we're here, and I just want to talk about hyperspace. And let's just have a look at hyperspace when we're in it. Uh, let's go to the, um, how far away is the Kite system? So we can stop at another um, generation ship. Okay, it's not too far away. Right, so let's uh, switch off that. Um, okay, go to the Kite system. Okay, it's not too far away. Uh, for my ship, that's going to be a couple of jumps. Now, as we do the jumps, right? As we do the jumps, let's talk about hyperspace as it appears in Elite Dangerous, right? Uh, so, again, look at the jump. So, off we go. Full thrust, hyperspace jump to the system. Okay, so we're charging the drive. It's quite similar to the Galcop era, right? In the sense that um, it has to charge up. In fact, it takes even longer to charge up here than it did then. Um, okay, and some of that's gamey. I get that, you know. You know, we can't be totally and utterly tied <laughs> to realism. But we jump into this, right? Now, where is this? Okay, we're flying through stuff, right? There's lights in here. Um, there's structure, there's so we're flying through some other place, right? Um, and then we, we then we emerge at the star, okay? Now, um, why do we emerge at the star? Well, there's no real reason in the law as to why we emerge at the star. We're heading for the Kitai system. Um, fuel scooping is very similar to the original game. If you join me on Saturdays, you can uh, you can watch me do some fuel scooping on occasion. Um, so let's just jump to the key tie system. Um, but notice the key tie system is in, as you can see, we can see the stars, 25 light years away. My Cobra is, my Cobra is quite good, okay? The uh, key tie system is where we're heading. I've just cut my ship slightly there, apologies for that. 25 light years away, we can see it visually, okay? There is no nebula between us and the key tie system. We are not traveling through normal space, okay? We're not traveling through normal space when we go into hyperspace. We're going somewhere else. Um, now I still call that zoned witch space, right? And um, from what I've seen of the way that hyperdictions work, I've actually been hyperdicted myself a couple of times in the street for weeks um, when I went out to the Pleiades. Um, Thargoids are able to rip you out of wherever this is, right, and drop you back into normal space. Um, so this is an is this is space. Now we are not, as you can see, I might have got my my hope that's I can't navigate in here. I'm locked on a on a track, right? Uh, as you all know, you're familiar with this. Um, but we can't, can't, we can't navigate in there. Yet it seems, and according to the law, Thargoids are able to navigate in that zone. Okay. So um, we're not going to talk about the Thargoids too much because I've got an entire episode on them coming up. But Thargoids have, um, uh, Thargoids have, way more advanced hyperspace. Not necessarily technology, but perhaps understanding is a better way of talking about it, right? Um, so um, they are able to manipulate Thargoid. Uh, you will notice when you encounter a Thargoid, when they leave, you never encounter a Thargoid using the frameshift drive, okay? They're always either in real space or they're accessing hyperspace. They, they don't appear. In, in frameshift, right? You, ne you only see human commanders using frameshift. So it seems the Thargoids don't have that frameshift Alcubierre warp drive technology at all. Or if they do, they don't use it. Um, so that's an interesting question. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit more with the Thargoids. And there is a lot of speculation around where does our own hyperspace technology come from? And we'll go into that um, with, with the Thargoid thing because there's, there's, there's some links in the law to that. Okay. Um, um, so, uh, so there we go, and that, that's 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 a bit of a strange thing. Now, while we're here, uh, let us go to um, the the Venusian generation ship. We should be able to find that if I can remember how to do an FSS scan again. Um, and scroll down. I used to know this. My muscle memory's gone a bit. There we go. Oh, to play established. Okay, and we're back. And hopefully, there's all sorts of stuff going on here. Is it showing up? Ooh. Zephyrus. No, that's a, that's a system. What, I, what did I say? <laughs> I've already lost it. Uh, we're looking for Venusium. Okay. 
Uh, oh, hang on, that one's uh, 2.5k towards Zephyrus. That means what we have to fly in that direction. I thought we'd have picked it up on the scanner. Okay, hang on, let's just look at it here again. Um, there's a cockpit there. Then we dock. There's a tanker. Where is the Where is the gen ship? Is the question. Hmm. Does anybody know in the chat? I've just been looking that one up because it was quite close by. Um, after entering the system, orientate your ship towards the Zephyr system. Okay, let's do that. Um, 2.5k light seconds isn't too far. Okay, so let's just head that way. Right, so follow me, everybody, and we'll see if we can encounter it. Frame shift drive. So this is so the frame shift drive. Okay, is is our ability to travel at super light speed yet in the solar system? Um, oh, there it is. I've got it. Right, there we go. Um, that's cool. Okay, right. So can I? Oh, I can't hook onto it. That's interesting. Right, so I'm gonna just have to adjust the frame shift drive manually. Right, so we'll drop out there, and that will be our that will be our, our point. Um, um, so maybe my FSS didn't pick it up for whatever reason, but there we go. Um, so yeah, so um, the frame shift drive is a capability that we have in Elite Dangerous. Now, let me just show you one other thing, okay? Um, and I'll wait till we get there um, and drop out because I want to show you the original Elite again, okay? Um, because of this frame shifting mechanism, right? And it's interesting that the frame shift drive exists in the way it does. Now, this is partly because of uh, the fans, actually. Uh, something called the um, uh, what was it called? The DD, the DDF. <laughs> which originally stood for Design Decision Forum and then later got renamed to Design Discussion Forum for reasons that we were not uh, um, uh, we, we don't need to go into now but that, that's the law of Elite Dangerous right rather than that's all the meta law rather than the actual law um, and um, we um, but in there you know originally um, yeah, Frontier had come up with the idea of micro jumps between various different points of interest in the system, and then the, the, the fans didn't like that, okay, because it wasn't very elite -y, right? Um, so, um, what they came up with is this frame shift drive, which allows you to move around the space in the system, and then these kind of POIs that you can then lock onto and then drop into, um, in order to give you the ability to fly around in, in space. And so, the frame shift drive allows you to move around. A solar system or a star system at a reasonable rate you know many many times faster than the speed of light you can see i'm slowing down now but i was up to like 21 times the speed of light right yeah well super cruise exactly right as we, as we as we call it um and it you know it's pretty handy right because otherwise you know things and it's you know there's there's the, the whole multiplayer design of the game and all that sort of stuff as well um so um so yeah so this stuff is interesting because um, you know, this is design consideration. So the frame shift drive is all about uh, allowing us to move around quickly. Okay, now micro jumps um, are quite interesting. I didn't. I, I must. I tend to agree that I didn't. There we go. And there's, a, there's another generation ship. Um, very nice too. Uh, but you see generation ship. So let's just hold the position. There's a slightly different design here, but very similar layout to the previous one. Now let me just go and fire up that that original elite again because I want to show you I want to show you something there. Um, spectacular! Now I'm going to use the the spectrum version because actually this bit of it is better um, than the elite version, uh, the the BBC version. So let me just go and get that, that reasonable save game. Let's just launch on the ship. Uh, I'm going to do a hyperspace jump very quickly. Um, and ooh, wrong map. We've got no play. Oh, it's crashed again. Why does it keep doing this? We never have to investigate because something's not quite happy. Anyway, right. That'll do. Come on. Let me just give me a hyperspace jump to Leasty. Um, okay, so in the original game, you hyperspace somewhere really fast, as we've talked about. Um, through which space, right? Okay, it's just circles, I know, but it's still, it's still a tunnel, right? That bears some resemblance to Elite Dangerous. And then when you arrive in the system, you're a long way from the planet, okay? 
Um, and watch what happens now, okay? I can speed up, I can travel through real space to get there, but that will take quite a long time. So I have what's called in the Spectrum version a jump, a, a tourist drive. But on the BBC version, I think it's called the skip drive, okay? Um, and watch what happens, okay? So I press engage the drive, and I magically move closer to the planet until I get mass locked by the presence of another ship, okay? So I get forced out of whatever that is. And that, I believe, is just an asteroid, so I'm just going to kill it and continue on. Oh, it's not an asteroid. <laughs> I don't have any trouble. Um, and that's launching ships at me. Oh, there we go. A crate and a... Oh, I'm again. Anyway, there we go. Okay, so you saw it, right? Uh, let me shut that down and get back to really. Um, so <laughs> it's one of the problems of the 8-bit game, right, is it's really hard to distinguish between asteroids and, and other ships. Um, so what happened there was, right, we can... There was a lack of frame shift type drive in the original Elite, right? So not only did we lose hyperspace tech, we also lost... Um, we also lost that Taurus skip jump drive technology in real space as well. So, in many ways, what we have now with hyperspace and the frame shift drive is Elite Dangerous is actually much closer to the original Elite game, and thus in the lore, the original technology from 200 years ago, than actually some of the intervening stuff. So it's all quite interesting, right? Uh, all quite interesting how that's kind of gone almost full circle, partly, partly in the lore. Hyperspace technology has evolved, and we're now at a place where hyperspace has unlocked the galaxy. We can travel across the galaxy at extremely, really fast rates, and, and things have kind of moved on. So hyperspace is now a big, big deal. It's commercially available. Everybody's got it. It's been in. It's been commercialised, and you can stick it in a sidewinder, um, and then you can pretty much go anywhere you like, right? Um, and that's how the law has changed with hyperspace. So generation ships were really, really early on. Really, really early. Um, maybe 70,000 of them. That's how the initial bubble was colonised. Then hyperspace technology slowly evolves. It takes a long time to get going, but by 2800 we have that branch line network of navigable hyperspace technology, but it's only for people who've got access to it, right? So there's permits and tunnels and all of this. It's like a road network, right? But, but hyperspace. And then, as the original game happens in 3125, hyperspace evolves to a point where you can fit it aboard a relatively small ship and go and do it yourself. That's how the original Elite portrays it. Then Galcop collapses. That's a whole subject by itself which we'll be covering next week. Um, what happened to Galcop? This amazing organisation that suddenly fell apart, right? Um, and then the Federation of the Empire is all that's left. Um, and then we've lost that technology. The Federation of the Imperial technology is way inferior to what Galcop had. Um, and it takes us then another hundred years to get a hyperspace technology that's as good as, or even sub, you know, surpasses what was available in the Galcop. So that story there is a little bit like the collapse of the Roman Empire, right, where we lose technology for hundreds of years, um, and we don't exceed. In, you know, if we look at our own history, we don't exceed the levels of technology in the Roman Empire until maybe almost the, the Renaissance, right? Um, you know, over a thousand years later. So these things do happen in real history, right? We, we regress for a time, and that's what happened in the Elite Dangerous Universe with the hyperspace tech. And, you know, we still don't understand it completely. The Thargoids can do things in hyperspace which we can't do. They seem to be able to do point-to-point -point travel. We can't do that. Um, the only exception is, and I, again, this isn't confirmed anywhere that I've been able to establish in the law, is what do the, the big ships do, okay? And maybe the fleet carriers as well, right? Now, um, they seem to go through a cloud, right? It's not quite like the Frontier 52 and the Frontier 50 captains. Um, but they, you know, the Imperial capital ships and the Federation capital ships, the Interdictor class, big things, right? Um, and the fleet carriers appear to be able to go through a cloud. They sort of move through a sort of lightning conducting cloud, which looks very similar to the uh, Frontier Elite 2 and the Frontier First Encounters effect if you kind of took it into the universe and made it through the graphics, right? So, speculation, because it's not, it's not confirmed in the law anywhere I found, but maybe those big ships still use a version of the 2B, well, that, what I call, now what's in Galnet, the 2B drive, okay? Um, because that drive did at least allow you not to be tied to going to the sun every time, like the current frame shift drive hyperspace technology does. Um, so, speculation, but um, the 
those big ships may be using a modified version of a 2B drive which allows them to hyperspace to a specific point. And we know now in the law, because the fleet carriers are doing this, um, uh, is that they can go into, they can come out of hyperspace, their hyperspace jumps allow them to come out of hyperspace in orbit around astronomical bodies other than the star, right? So it's clearly capable of doing so. Um, I don't think it's been written anywhere about exactly what the fleet carrier's hyperspace technology is. So that is um, that is that is a bit of speculation. That is a bit of speculation. Um, so um, so there we go. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that that is something that's. I'm going to keep following actually with a little bit of interest to see if they do expand on it because I don't think it's been written down anywhere how that technology works. It's not in Galnet as far as I've been able to find. Um, so um, there's um, there's there's lots of stuff there. There's lots of stuff there. Okay. Um, and um, and that is that's basically how the hyperspace technology hyperspace technology has evolved over all those kind of years, right? So we have uh, Galnet um, talking about the overall hyperspace technology. We have the generation ships way back in the day, and then hyperspace slowly takes over. And by the time of Elite Dangerous, it's ubiquitous everywhere, right? Um, hyperspace is um, available in virtually every ship, um, uh, every ship that we've sent players on by, uh, and we can use it to traverse the galaxy. And its jump range has been improving, 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 improving in a very, very short frame of, uh, frame of time. But um, still, a lot we don't know about it, particularly around the kind of the dark voids and some of these capabilities. So hyperspace may change, right? Hyperspace may change, uh, and I don't know what we'll see in the new era. Maybe new stuff will be coming along. So all sorts of things to kind of keep out an eye out for there. So, so there we go, my friends. There we go. Um, we will we will talk a little bit about the Thargoids in um, in an upcoming stream, um, and uh, you know kind of go through that sort of stuff as well because they've got they've got um, some stuff about um, hyperspace in them as well. Uh, and there's also the Alliance. Okay, now the Alliance is a little bit later on. I'm just trying to remember when when I'm talking about the Alliance. It's it's quite a way down. Uh, let me just have a quick look because I can't remember when I've scheduled it in. Um, dangerous law tour. There we go. Uh, it's far faster to find it on Google. <laughs> it is to find it on my own website. Um, right, when am I talking about? Right, the, right, the history of the alliance is a few weeks away, Ray. Right, um, so um, so we'll, we're going to be talking about um, them. They've got they've got some stuff about um, the, um, you know, the the um, the hyperspace as well. So and there's some connections with the Thargoids and various other bits and pieces in there as well. Uh, and I think someone's just raided me. So <laughs> hello to whoever's whoever's done that. Uh, Jack Little is raiding me. Hello, good to see you guys. Thank you very much for turning up. That's awesome. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's, there's still more of this story to come, right? Okay, and there's a few leads and things that we need to kind of um, we kind of need to play with there too. So, um, yeah, lots more to come next week. Next week, um, I'm hoping again to have a special guest on, but we're going to we're going to be sticking with the law, okay? So unlike just a more general chat like we have with Kate, we're sticking with the law because I've got um, lined up. Um, you know, one of the original people who's worked on the the law of elite for many decades, um, and uh, I hope you have him in the chat. And we're going to be talking about Galcop, okay? So the you know we're going to go back in time and concentrate a bit more on the eight bit era, and talk about the political structure of the galaxy as it was from 2800, uh, which is kind of where we got up to up until the era of the original game, 3125, and talk about Galcop and what happened there, okay? And, um, and and pick that a little bit apart so you can see the um, the background to it. So yes, so Daddy Hoggy always already, already got it. So I'm hoping to have, and I will confirm with him this week. He certainly said he was up for it. Um, uh, Mr. Dave Hughes, uh, Mr. Dave Sel uh, I can't say his word. Seslin, 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 Selezin. He will shoot me. Um, um, anyway, Dave Hughes, right? He will hopefully be joining me next week to talk us through um, Galcop um, and, and some of the cool stuff around that structure of, of, of the original game and the political environment that was around before we learnt about the Federation of the Empire um, in, in the law. And so we'll, we'll, we'll start there. Now that means I will need you to all um, rendezvous in the, um, in the lave system. Okay, now the lave system is incredibly important to Elite. Um, you know, Alan Stroud set a book there, um, Labor Revolution, which is worth a read, and it is um, it is kind of the place where Elite's story starts in many ways. It's the place that you launched out of in the original game, 
and lots and lots of stuff happens there. It's, I think I'm right in saying actually, the, um, even the Dark Wheel starts in Lave. Yes, it does. Um, so you know, the first thing that's ever written down in the Elite um, uh, thing there, from the moment the trading ship Avalonia slipped its orbital berth above the planet Lave. So Lave is where everything starts, right? Um, that's where the law starts, uh, the, the Lave system. So head to the Lave system. Uh, it's easy to find. It's not too far away from the Core Worlds. Um, sorry, it's in the Core Worlds. But it's in a part of the galaxy that um, Dave Hughes and I have always called uh, the Old Worlds. Okay, there it is there. So that's where you've got to go for next week. All right? Lave system. And there's a few other interesting places around here as well, which we will tour around and talk about. And that's going to be quite good fun. So, um, so see you there. See you and Lave for, for, the, for the next episode of the Elite Dangerous Law Tour, the unofficial Elite Dangerous Law Tour, hosted by your host, Drew Wager. I can't do that seriously. Um, thank you again ever so much for coming. It's lovely to see so many coming along, right? And, and being interested in the background law. So, you know, this tour is aimed at, you know, some of, some of the veterans who might not have covered this in the past, but uh, more, aim, it's, it's aimed at anybody who just wants to kind of get a toe hold on the law and understand it. You know, I'm not going to dive into everything in detail because there's so much for more for you to go off and have a look at, right? Um, there's all those generation ships. We were told there were 16 of them. So, you know, there's the, go off and find them, right? Go and go and find all the ships nodding on the screen. Um, you know, go and go and check out the logs. But you know, there's some good stories and stuff to dig into there again. So it's all all kind of good fun, right? Um, it's it's all supposed to be fun and enjoyable and, and give you the kind of background. But it, you know, when you're playing the game, you're in the year 33. What are we now? 3306. Um, there is some history to why you're in a ship with a hyperspace technology and why you know the bubble is the way it is and why you know different ship designs are out there and all sorts of stuff and we're, you know we're slowly digging into that sort of stuff it gives you a grounding to the game it makes the game more fun to play right that's that's the way i always look at these things that's what law is for you know it, it's not it's not a it's not a box where you mix well that's not a law you can't say that you know it's designed to add more to the game that's what law is all about and that's what all the stories and stuff are about too it gives you a bit more flavor and make, make the thing more fun to play in. so that's that's my aim with these tours right is, is, to, is to make your gameplay experience that little bit better. Uh, so thank you very much for your company. Um, always good. Meet us in the Lave system for next week and we will um, we will start talking um, about the old world, Galcop, and uh, and that whole piece of interesting Elite Dangerous history, which is really around the original, original game. Very close to my heart, so I'm really looking forward to it. And I know Dave is a massive original elite fan as well so we'll, we'll be talking about that kind of good stuff it's going to be fun it's going to be fun so see you there right on commanders um and um yeah oh seven i got to use that hand no. <laughs> it's a left-handed salute for oh seven but i will see you next week thank you very much see you in live system be good take care of the virus do the usual sensible stuff right and um see you soon you guys have an absolute great time uh, if you want to join me tomorrow for a bit of Stellaris, please do. And on Saturday, of course, an ongoing playthrough of the ZX Spectrum. So, there we have it. That's the uh, end of this week's tour. A few, uh, few interesting snippets. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's all very good. So, uh, yeah, on to uh, onwards and upwards then, and on to next week, uh, where we'll be starting in live. So, uh, yeah, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, there wasn't a lot of flying about tonight, so there wasn't a lot to really see or get excited about, but it's all about what we're getting told, not what we're seeing. So, thanks for watching, folks. Please like, share, subscribe, leave any comments underneath. Uh, to subscribe, hit the logo in the top left. And to see the other videos in the Elite Dangerous playlist, hit the logo on the top right. Tally bye.